Uh, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I uh, was at Ashland a few years ago when I was a policy um, analyst in the Reagan administration. Uh, I was introduced by, uh, I don't know if it was Mr. White or one of the Ashbrook scholars who uh, rattled off a, a list of credentials and then ended up by saying, and now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the latest uh, dope from the White House, and then pointed to me. <laughs> I don't know, many of you are from the business community and are probably somewhat unfamiliar with some of the uh, uh, required etiquette of political correctness, which is part of my subject for tonight. So I thought I would enlighten you uh, for the question and answer session. If you, if you have occasion to refer to American Indians, I think most of you know by now they should be Native Americans. Uh, if you have cause to refer to your pet, it is now your animal companion. And I think some of you uh, are, know that if you uh, make reference to, to short people, uh, they are apparently uh, the vertically challenged. So <laughs> keep, keep this in mind. Uh, before, uh, before I wrote my, my book on higher education, I guess I was mainly known in connection with my uh, infamous undergraduate campus newspaper, the Dartmouth Review, which has been in involved in a 10-year skirmish with the university administration. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, we used to tell the deans that, that taking on the review is a little bit like, like wrestling with a pig, because not only does it get everyone dirty, uh, but the pig likes it. <laughs> my, uh, my topic for today is, uh, is a somewhat uh, difficult one. It's uh, the topic of race, uh, a subject which has been difficult and divisive in this country from its very beginning. There is a kind of silent revolution that is going on on American campuses, uh, a revolution that goes by many names. We hear about pluralism, about multiculturalism. We hear about the need for diversity. Uh, basically, what's happening underlying this is a, is a kind of important change. Uh, American society is becoming more diverse, more heterogeneous. Uh, one reason for this is immigration. Uh, it used to be the case that most immigrants who came to this country came from Europe. Uh, that's no longer true. Most immigrants today uh, come from Asia, come from Latin America. So we are witnessing what one writer has called the recoloring of America, a kind of changing of the national complexion. Uh, a second factor is that domestically, or within this country, uh, the birth rates of minority groups are somewhat higher than those of whites. So when you put these two factors together, you see that this country is undergoing a kind of gradual or not so gradual transition. And I think quite properly, a lot of colleges and universities are saying that young people need to be prepared or equipped for the special challenges of living and governing an increasingly diverse or multiracial society. Uh, that is a quite legitimate task. I want to emphasize that the whole debate the whole argument focuses on the means, on the specific policies that are used to achieve these uh, shared goals. Now, at the University of California, at Berkeley, it turns out, uh, quite recently I approached the director of admissions, a fellow named Robert Bailey, and I asked him a pretty straightforward question. I said, imagine the case of a student applying to this university, Berkeley, who has a great average in high school of B plus to A minus, uh, and an SAT, a Scholastic Aptitude Test Score, of about 1,200 out of 1,600. In other words, a very good student. And I said, if this student happens to be, let us say, Hispanic, what would be the probability that he or she would be admitted to Berkeley? And he replied, the probability would be 100%. The student would be sure to get in. I said, fine. Now let's imagine a student with the same grades, with the same test scores, and with the same extracurricular talent, uh, but the student is like me of, of Asian origin, or the student happens to be white, what would be the probability that that same student would be admitted to Berkeley? And he replied, look, the probability would be approximately five, five percent. In other words, what Berkeley has done, which is increasingly not the exception, but, but the norm, the rule, is to establish some form of racial preferences in its student admissions policy. To some degree, these also extend to faculty hiring as well. Now, some critics have said the university is getting rid of merit in its application process. Not true. Uh, Berkeley is considering merit, but within your racial group, 
So if you are an Asian applicant to Berkeley, Berkeley will take the best Asians. If you are a Hispanic applicant, Berkeley will admit the best Hispanics, and so on. But it's very important to realize that there is no direct competition across racial lines. Each applicant seems to compete for admissions to the selective college by running or competing within your own racial lane. I think this kind of policy, this policy that goes by the name of affirmative action, uh, raises some fundamental questions of justice. Uh, first, it is true that the university policies, the university admissions policies, are implemented to fight, to combat, a long history of discrimination. There, that is undeniable. The question I want to raise is whether universities are very effective in fighting discrimination by practicing discrimination. In other words, do we effectively combat historic racism by institutionalizing what seem to be new forms of racism? Uh, a second factor is who should bear the cost of these so-called affirmative action policies? In the particular case of Asians, here is a group that is itself in this country a minority, that has itself suffered some discrimination, that has clearly played no part in the historical crimes for which affirmative action is said to be a needed solution. So why is it fair to impose some of the burden or cost of this policy on this particular group? A third factor, closely related, is what effect does affirmative action have on the groups that it seeks to help? I strolled across the Berkeley campus to what the administration calls, somewhat euphemistically, the Office of Retention. Uh, there I was told that the dropout rates for affirmative action groups are disastrously high. For example, while whites and Asians graduate from Berkeley at the rate of about 75%, 75 to 80%, the graduation rate for Hispanic students is only about 50%. Only one in two students graduates. For black students, it's even lower than that. And these figures, by the way, are not unique to Berkeley. They are replicated, they are duplicated on the national scale. So the affirmative action policies are, to some degree, misplacing a number of minority students in higher education. What I'm trying to suggest is that these policies do not increase the aggregate or total number of minority kids in higher education, not at all. The total number of minority students in higher education has remained roughly constant for over 20 years. In fact, a number of years it's gone down. What the affirmative action policies or the racial preference policies have done, or their effect, has been to take young people who have the grades and test scores to be admitted to Virginia Community College and accept them via preferences into UVA, the University of Virginia, or to take kids who have the grades and test scores to succeed at UVA and admit them to Berkeley, or to take kids who have the grades and test scores for Berkeley and get them admitted to Princeton or to Yale or to Ashland. There is a there is a kind, of, a kind of ratcheting up effect, which is an important factor. It's not the only factor, but it's an important factor behind the uh, depressingly high dropout rates that minority students suffer in American higher education. Now, a second factor that is very noticeable to anyone who is close to or on campus is what one Afro-American studies professor, Troy Duster, has called the new racial separatism on campus. It's a very striking fact uh, 35 years ago, this country made a kind of public commitment to the ideal of desegregation, the famous Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education, the goal of integration, integration of public schools, modes of transportation, restaurants, and so on. Uh, strangely, 35 years or 40 years later, if you stroll the campuses of our finest private or state colleges, not even the colleges of the Deep South, but colleges of the Northeast and the West and the, and the Midwest, uh, you are struck by a kind of evident or conspicuous racial separatism. There is not a lot of interaction among different groups. Groups tend to hang separately. I'm not, by the way, speaking solely of voluntary association, a group of students eating together. I'm talking about what often is university subsidized and to some degree university uh, recognized uh, racial separatism on campus. For example, it is not uncommon uh, on campuses today including a number of campuses in this state, to have separate dormitory facilities uh, for minorities. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania recently funded a black yearbook called Positively Black, in which black kids appear in a black yearbook and everyone else appears in a kind of general uh, yearbook. 
Uh, it is frequent on college campuses today to have separate minority orientation ceremonies. So when you show up as a freshman, the minority students are separated and given their own unique uh, initiation into campus life. I'm talking, in other words, of a somewhat advanced pattern of racial separatism, uh, one that I think really calls into question whether or not our universities are committed to establishing some model of a common culture, by which I mean simply a community of young people with a shared commitment to what higher education or to what liberal learning uh, is all about. Now, a lot of young people on our campuses are aware of these facts. I, they are aware of the existence, even the pervasiveness, of covert forms of racial preferences. They are aware of the striking phenomenon of racial separatism on campus. And they begin to talk about these subjects among themselves. Uh, they realize very quickly when they talk about these subjects that it's quite hard to discuss subjects of race, subjects of ethnicity. Very difficult to talk about these subjects in public. You have to talk about them by and large in private. Now, there's a reason for this, by the way. When you discuss a subject like affirmative action or racial preferences on campus, you are going to give some distress or even some pain to minority students on campus. Uh, the reason for this is that young people are naturally somewhat insecure, and you come to a good school uh, like Ashland, and you wonder, uh, am I as smart as everybody else here? Can I do the work? Uh, do I belong here? Affirmative action policies put these questions into italics. Uh, they put a kind of invisible uh, question mark, or quotation marks, if you will, uh, around the achievements of minorities, regardless of whether we benefit from these particular programs. And so when you talk about a subject like racial preferences or like affirmative action, you're raising a very touchy question. Who deserves to be here? Who, has a right, who is part of this community as a legitimate member? These questions, as like I say, are going to give some discomfort, even some distress. And universities know this. Uh, college deans know this. Professors know this. Uh, many of them would like to protect what they see as the legitimate self-pride of minority students on campus. And they try to do this by regulating, by regulating the public discussion of a whole series of controversial questions surrounding race uh, and ethnicity to a lesser degree gender and sexual orientation. It is this effort to regulate the public discussion that we call the effort to impose or enforce PC, or politically correct points of view. It is an enterprise aimed at teaching young people not how to think, but what to think on a whole range of controversial uh, questions. It is an effort to arm twist young people to adopt a sensitive or enlightened or politically correct points of view. And a whole range of topics that I think should be part of the le legitimate domain of discussion have become somewhat driven from the public square. Uh, are these racial preference policies fair? Uh, are there differences between men and women? And do these have any social significance? Uh, should one be able to articulate moral criticism of homosexuality? All of these topics have become somewhat taboo. Uh, and they are difficult to talk about both inside or outside uh, the classroom. Uh, that effort at chilling the public debate, I think, constitutes to some degree the essence of PC or political correctness. Let me say thirdly that there is a new development that is perhaps the most serious of all, and that is an effort that is aimed at transforming the traditional liberal curriculum, an effort that says that the existing curriculum in our colleges and universities reflects a very systematic bias, in fact, the systematic bias of white males. Uh, sometimes it's added dead white males. And the argument is made that the curriculum needs to be transformed uh, in order to represent other groups, to represent what about women, what about representing uh, minorities, persons of color, natives of the third world, and so on. This sort of critique has become very cogent, very articulate, very influential uh, in the academy. What's interesting about it, by the way, is it is to some degree nothing more than the argument for affirmative action transplanted onto the reading list. In other words, the the multiple track racial admission system that I mentioned earlier, the system of racial preference does not stop at the admissions gate, but it lives on, it is mirrored, it is duplicated, it is replicated onto the argument over what students learn. And the argument is made very powerfully today that the curriculum needs to be rationed to some degree along the lines of race, along the lines of gender, along the lines of sexual orientation, and so on. 
I think it's important to ask, is this critique of the curriculum in fact true? Is the curriculum in fact biased in this nefarious way? Uh, we can look very briefly at the example of Isaac Newton. Uh, Isaac Newton was a white male, I will admit. Uh, Isaac Newton uh, may have been a heterosexual, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this is particularly relevant to any discussion of the theory of gravity. Uh, here is an idea that would seem to be perfectly accessible to women, uh, to Hispanics, to natives of India, and so on. And the argument against Newton seems to confuse his origins with the content of his ideas, with the content of his ideas, moreover, that seems to be unrelated to or to transcend the fact that Newton may have been white or male or whatever. Uh, we can ask about Shakespeare. Shakespeare was a white male, but so were a lot of other poets who composed in Elizabethan England. Why do we read Shakespeare and not them? Uh, is it because a, a group, a cabal of white males got together and said, gee, he's, he's whiter than any of us? Obviously not. Uh, the appeal of Shakespeare has everything to do with the content of his ideas, with his sonnets, with his plays, and so on. So I think, unfortunately, the danger in, in the liberal arts curriculum is we are moving toward what I call a, a weird cultural Olympics in which each group is approaching the reading list and asking this question, what did my guys do? Uh, this is a somewhat narrow, I think, a somewhat limiting question that tends to take knowledge and ideas uh, and apply it as though it is simply the cultural patent of a particular ethnic group, uh, as though writers can be reduced to little more than the race, the gender, and the sexual behavior of their authors. Uh, it's almost as though the, the logic of this view is almost that a lot of young uh, white guys get up in the morning and are very happy when they, when they look in the mirror because um, Homer wrote the Iliad. Uh, this assumption of, of uh, the cultural patent of knowledge, I think, is not really what liberal education is about. It tends to reduce ideas to simple uh, uh, accidents of race or gender or ethnicity. Um, to me, liberal education reflects an effort to transcend, to cross, uh, to navigate uh, across these chasms of, of race and gender, to some degree to transcend those narrow categories. Uh, let me give you an example. I mean, is it not true that I could um, take as my role model, if I wanted to, uh, Martin Luther King, even though he was African American, a black man? Uh, is it not true that Martin Luther King got some of his ideas from my countryman, Mahatma Gandhi? Uh, Gandhi got many of his ideas in England and in South Africa in a tradition of civil disobedience with its roots in people like Thoreau. Uh, the essence of liberal education is not to freeze ideas into a particular narrow cultural category, but to try to find ways to make a kind of empathetic leap across cultural boundaries. If I may sum up, I would say that three of the most fundamental principles of higher education or liberal education I think are being gradually undermined or, or eroded. First, liberal education, I think, should be about equal opportunity, about giving everyone a fair chance. Uh, Martin Luther King put it pretty well when he said, judge us on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. The unfortunate reality of life on all too many American campuses, I know of very few exceptions, is some form of race-based preferences, both in student admissions as well as in faculty hiring. Second, liberal, liberal education should be about integration, about creating something resembling a common community. The reality of life on all too many campuses, again, there are virtually no exceptions, is a very noticeable and evident racial separatism, the so-called new segregation on campus. And third, I think liberal education should be about free and open debate, about free speech, and I think about high academic standards to prepare our young people to compete in an increasingly competitive uh, society. The reality of life all too often is that even free speech is often regarded on campus today as being, well, one value that needs to be balanced against or subordinated to or sacrificed on the altar of other social uh, and political uh, values like sensitivity or diversity. So I think in a quite serious sense, uh, some of the three, some of the basic pillars of what higher education are all about these pillars are being attacked, are being chipped away at, uh, are being toppled. And I think those of us who, are, who care about higher education, those of us who invest in higher education, either as parents or as taxpayers or as alumni, need to ask some very tough questions about what our universities are doing uh, with the money. Uh, 
what kinds of policies are being put into effect. Not in order to topple or reverse this multi-racial uh, revolution, but in order to constructively redirect it so that we can preserve the dual virtues of excellence and equity, so that we can prepare young people to be effective workers and at the same time help them to be good citizens uh, in an emerging multi-racial society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Covered an awful lot of territory, and I know we have questions. And uh, Nish has deliberately left plenty of time to try to answer your questions. So, who wants to start? Question. I'm astonished you overwhelmed them. Uh, we must have. How is the current financial cutbacks in higher education going to affect? particularly what you refer to. Question and the president is how are the cutbacks in higher education going to affect particularly this issue? Well, I don't know if the fundamental problem, it's part of the problem but not the whole story, uh, to look at the issue of funding because in the last few decades, the amount of funding not only in higher education but on the public school system uh, has increased dramatically. Uh, appropriations have gone up uh, in geometric, geometric fashion. Uh, this has corresponded with a kind of staggering decline in academic standards. In fact, if you put a graph, you would, be, uh, you would not be wrong in con concluding that there was an inverse relationship between the amount of money spent on public education or higher education and the quality of students coming out of the system. I'm not saying that, that funding doesn't, uh, can, cannot help particular programs, but simply that it's not the only answer. Uh, and what we need, I think, in, in the public schools is more emphasis on questions of discipline, more emphasis on rigorous curricula, more emphasis on requirements. This is also true in colleges. I think the issue is not so much uh, a problem of funding, but a problem of priorities. A lot of colleges these days are establishing new requirements to, to require the study uh, of uh, Afro-American history, of non-Western cultures. I'm not against that. The problem is not that young people are ignorant of Africa. The problem is that young people are ignorant. A lot of people are graduating from our colleges uh, without a basic understanding of some of the fundamental principles of their own culture. And I would say that if we're going to establish requirements, we should start by saying that you should not be able to finish college without having some understanding of the American founding, maybe read, Link, uh, read the Federalist Papers. Without some understanding of the Civil War, you may have to read Lincoln's second inaugural. Without some exposure to the Civil Rights Movement, you read uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. I saw a rather depressing sight the other day, a student, um, on television was saying he was very excited to discover the uh, canonical writings of the civil rights movement, and he was particularly happy to come across the works of Malcolm X. So <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is a kind of abysmal uh, failure uh, to do the job of what one writer has called uh, transmitting the cultural gonads from one generation to the next. Once that basic knowledge is acquired, you want, to, you want to expand your horizons, read the Quran, by all means read Confucius and so on, but you have to start with, with the basics and that is not being transmitted. question is really the, the issue of freedom of choice in education. Well, in, in, in principle, I am uh, emphatically in favor of the idea of choice in, 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 uh, in public education and, and in the elementary and secondary schools. I know that the debate about choice is, uh, breaks down 
uh, into whether or not parents should be able to choose pu which public school they go to or whether they should be given vouchers or tax credits to go to private schools. I'm certainly sympathetic to experiments in those areas because I think we need to explore more than one avenue to see what, what seems to work best. In colleges, the debate is much more complicated because very often parents will say or ask, which college should I send my child to? And there are some college guides that are being published now that say uh, things like, that emphasize schools that are less or more politically correct and say, look, you may want to send your, your, your child to this school or that. Very often, the real problem is not so much going to one school or the other, but trying to have a roadmap within a particular institution to know what kinds of courses you should be taking in order to get a fundamental or basic exposure to the kinds of ideas uh, that you should have. So in other words, when if you show up at, at a college uh, today, when I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, for example, you are confronted with a smorgasbord, I mean a bewildering array of literally hundreds if not thousands of courses, uh, and you are given absolutely no guidance as to which, w what coherent curriculum uh, you can develop that's going to uh, provide you with a sound basis for a liberal education. There seems to be a kind of moral equivalence between courses, and all you have to do is satisfy some uh, pallid distributive requirement. So, I think what, you, what students need is a lot more guidance and maybe a lot more requirements so that they are, are given a firm grounding uh, before they go on to, to what uh, are surely necessary electives, uh, elective courses. The question is if you... The question is, how do you increase the proportion of Hispanics or presumably other minority groups if you don't give them some break or some form of preference? Uh, and the answer, I think, in the short term is, uh, I have argued that we might be better off if we're going to have affirmative action. Let's have affirmative action not based on race, but affirmative action based on socioeconomic disadvantage. By this, I mean that we certainly have poor blacks and Hispanics in this country, but we also have poor whites uh, and poor Asians. Uh, and I think if we said that we are going to take this number of seats and allocate them based on disadvantage or based on need, we would benefit the most disadvantaged students from all groups. Now, blacks and Hispanics happen to be disproportionately concentrated in the ranks of the socioeconomically disadvantaged. So my program, if, I, if you want to call it that, uh, would nevertheless uh, extend benefits to those needy students. Uh, but we also recognize that there are a lot of blacks and Hispanics in the middle class or in the upper middle class. And it's very unclear well, why those families deserve benefits at all. Uh, it's not clear that they have been in any way held back in competing uh, for the scarce resources of our selective colleges. So I think a socioeconomically based program would work better than, than a race-based program. Do you have a question? Well, I think the question has to do with two, two things. One is the, about charges of racism and prejudice that are sometimes made too freely. Uh, and the second part has to do with the politics of history or the uh, effort to look at um, uh, the historical experience of particular groups. Now, we have to start by acknowledging a fact, and that is that there is a problem of racism in this country, and there is a very uh, uh, serious legacy uh, of discrimination, of, of uh, slavery, of segregation, and those scars are still uh, with us today. Uh, that being said, uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that we should not try to fight 
uh, that uh, discrimination uh, by uh, contributing to it. Uh, if you want to fight discrimination, the best way to do that is to stop discriminating. Uh, and so uh, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s was really built or based on two ideas. One was the idea of integration, Brown v. Board of Education, and the second idea was the idea of equal opportunity, well represented in Martin Luther King's line about judging us on the content of our character. The fact is that 25 years later or 20 years later, we have an entirely new civil rights agenda. In fact, many of the leaders of civil rights today will stand up and say, we don't believe in desegregation. We don't believe in the ideal of integration. Forget about the melting pot. We believe in an affirmation of ethnic differences, in a celebration of ethnic identity. And second, don't talk to us about judging people on the content of their character. Uh, we don't believe in this naive notion of color blindness. We believe in the indispensable necessity of some form of racial preferences. My point is that we have metamorphosed into a new civil rights agenda and a controversial agenda. A lot of Americans are opening up their eyes and are saying, this is not what we signed up for. Now, when they do that, a lot of activists will jump up and say, you're against civil rights. You're trying to turn back the clock. You're trying to reestablish the bad old days of segregation. And this charge, I think, misses the point that there are two competing visions uh, of civil rights. And it's a very legitimate question to ask which one is better uh, for this country. So I think what I would like to say is that this debate over competing visions of civil rights needs to, needs to take place. A second point about the politics of history I think it's healthy that some of the campuses are confronting questions that have been swept under the rug for some time. For example, there's nothing wrong in having a debate over the achievements, the good side and the bad side of, let us say, Christopher Columbus. Uh, there is no question that, to some degree, uh, Columbus was deified uh, in the 19th century. But we are sometimes tend to replace the deification of Columbus with the deification of the American Indian. I mean, we now have a kind of Kevin Costner romance with the American Indian, which presents a kind of Elysian or, or Edenic view that is itself untrue to the historical, historical record. There's an amusing line in, in uh, Dances with Wolves where Kevin Costner says something like, isn't it terrible that the white man has destroyed this most precious possession of the American Indian, the horse? Well, Indians had no horses before the white man got here. The horse was brought by the Spanish. Uh, I think there probably is probably nobody in this room who doesn't know about the existence uh, of white uh, slavery. Uh, probably there are not very many people here, including on campuses, who are aware that American Indians practiced slavery long before white people got here. My point is that to bring up a fact like this, if you, if you mention this, you, you are a spoiler at the multicultural picnic. You know, there's a tendency. <laughs> There's a tendency to replace the biases and the errors of the past with new forms of bias and prejudice. And what I'm saying is that we need to be critically, we need to look critically at the West. We also need to look critically at other cultures as well. Uh, the question is, what do the defenders of uh, political correctness uh, say uh, on their behalf? Um, well, uh, they say um, that America is uh, changing demographically uh, and that we are going to be in a society where you will have a substantial number of blacks and Hispanics and other minorities. In fact, they even make projections that say that whites will be a minority very soon. Uh, those projections uh, are, are, in fact, uh, not true, uh, or at least not true in the manner they are stated, because they have that uh, very misleading or, or very um, deft preamble, all other things being equal. Uh, they assume that immigration rates will continue at precisely the rate that they are now. They assume that minority birth rates will continue at precisely the rate they are now, whereas we know from experience that every time a group gains a certain measure of social prosperity, as soon as it raises its standard of living, its birth rate drops. And similarly, as other countries, like countries in Asia, gain more prosperity and begin to distribute that wealth, the incentive for people to, uh, to emigrate becomes much more diminished. So I'm not sure that those trends will continue in precisely the same degree. Uh, a second point is a real emphasis uh, in the university 
uh, on the question of victimization and on the question of the, the scars of racial prejudice and discrimination. And the argument is made that some measures are necessary uh, to rectify historical disadvantages and to give each group fair representation. In fact, this is even argued on behalf of democracy. We live in a democratic society, and the idea behind democracy is representation. So that being the case, it is only fair, it is only just under our political system to make sure that campuses of our schools, particularly our state schools, are proportionally represented or reflect the demographic distribution of racial uh, groups within the population. So if Hispanics are 15% in California, the argument goes, the University of California at Berkeley should have 15% of Hispanics in its freshman class. And uh, that is, uh, and similarly the curriculum uh, needs to be tailored in order to reflect this kind of racial breakdown, to give everybody their just desserts, so to speak. Uh, in part, I think what we're witnessing, though, on campus is um, a phenomenon that is a projection or a product of the, of the 1960s. Uh, a lot of the activists of the 1960s uh, are today's um, uh, tenured radicals, are today's college professors, are today's college deans. And you have to realize that this was a very eloquent and very articulate critique that was mounted in the 60s, not only of university life, but of the West in general. In the 60s, if you read countless eloquent tracts and books published in that time, you would tend to believe, gee, uh, Western and American values are uh, shrinking, that capitalism is beginning to totter and implode, its inner contradictions exposed, that socialism is the way of the future. Uh, if you were to believe these books and, and, and arguments, you would predict very safely that right now, uh, guerrilla revolutions of a Marxist stripe would be breaking out all over Asia and Africa and Latin America. And of course, the fact is that we live at a very astonishing uh, and unusual moment in history, uh, a moment in which uh, liberal and democratic and free market values are being voluntarily embraced by people in Barbados and in Bombay, uh, by people in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Uh, and uh, this has created, I think, a certain uh, trauma, a certain uh, crisis on the American campus. Um, it is something experiencing, uh, a lot of professors are experiencing a kind of ideological indigestion. Uh, and what they are saying, <coughs> and what they are saying is that we may not be able to influence events in the world. I mean, we can't put up the Berlin Wall. We can't reverse the outcome of the Nicaraguan election. We can't uh, uh, perhaps influence the ballot box in Washington. Uh, but we can take over the English department. So there's a temptation to say that here on campus, where we are in charge, uh, where our generation uh, has come to power, uh, we should impose our values of a good society or a multicultural society on this new generation of students or, or of young people. So a lot of the uh, struggle or a lot of the arguments on campus reflect a certain generational uh, tension uh, between uh, young people, many of whom are ideologically all over the place or unpredictable, independent, if you will, uh, and uh, who are not conforming with the political values of their, of their professors. I think the problem is not that universities are increasingly coming to resemble businesses, but that universities um, are not. Uh, in other words, universities operate uh, radically outside of, or to some degree detached from, uh, the realities uh, of operating in a market-governed uh, world. Uh, they are, in a certain sense, unaccountable. Uh, by this, I mean that um, the principles governing university life are to some degree a socialist. And I don't use that term pejoratively. I refer to faculty housing, the fact that most students who are on campus are, are, have their tuition paid by their parents or they are on grants and so on. There are very few people who are, in a certain sense, responding to market forces directly on the university campus. Uh, universities are, to a large degree, philanthropically funded. They get their money from foundations, to some degree from corporations, from state appropriations. And very often, state legislators are not, or, or alumni for that matter, are not asking very tough questions. Where is this money going? What is it spent for? What product are we getting for this? Uh, the universities have a lot of autonomy, 
uh, and that to some degree can be a virtue, but it does produce the danger of unaccountability. Uh, and that issue, I think, has really come to the fore in the last couple of years, especially uh, italicized with sites like the president of Stanford University showing up before a congressional panel trying to explain why he used federal money to purchase a, an antique 16th century Turkish commode. Um, and other such exotic expenses that colleges have felt free to build a government for because there has not been very much oversight. So I think that in order to raise standards, what we need is to make universities a lot more accountable to the communities that they, they, they want to serve.